back with transitional justice. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech on a given Monday afternoon, and we're talking today about violence in, in Colombia with Nicholas Sussman, a regular contributor who lives there in Bogota. Uh, so, Nicholas, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Jay. Uh, good night to all the people who is watching us, and it's always a pleasure to be with you. It's great to have you. So um, a lot of people weren't aware, but there has been violence and uh, sort of an unraveling in Colombia, which, uh, as you reported earlier, was doing pretty well, but maybe not now. What is happening in Colombia these days? Right. So right now we've been after more than a month of a national strike uh, that has turned very violent. It began as demonstrations against uh, what people consider a very unfair tax reform. And it was answered, the government responded with uh, disproportionate police violence, uh, with lack of disposition to dialogue, uh, and, and so on. So it then became uh, a national strike against everything that the people think is wrong about the, go about the government. And it has been met again with more police violence and a lot of, of situations where not only the police is participating in violence against the demonstrators, but also we are seeing uh, private individuals, civilians that are arming themselves to attack the demonstrators, which have, who have been mostly specific and never as violenced uh, as, the, as the violence they have received from, from governmental forces. Gee, so it's, uh, does it sound like the right and the left? The the right being the government and the left being the protesters. And, and of course, there will be people who are aligned with the right and the government. And so you do have two sides in the streets. How, how, how did it start? You're talking about a, um, you know, a, I guess, a, a labor movement of some kind. And, and how has it gone since then in terms of the escalation of violence? Right. So... Originally, this was a strike, like more, more than a strike, demonstrations called by something that has named itself like the National Strike uh, Committee. This National Strike Committee had been created uh, for, for some years ago, and it led the previous national strike that took place in 2019. This committee uh, has some labor unions, some labor movements, some educators, students, and so on. And they called for those demonstrations against uh, a very unfair tax, tax reform. Uh, so the, they are the ones who organized it at first, but now uh, it became a whole country, whole population thing. Uh, even there are parts and big parts and important parts of the population who say that this committee do not represent, does not represent them. And they are calling more for popular assemblies in the regions where the people can gather the ideas that they need to take to the government to solve it. So, so these were the people who organized it at first, but it has become bigger. And uh, I would say that at this point, this national strike committee does not represent the whole of the demonstrations. And just the precision, even if this national strike committee could be aligned with the left, Nowadays, I wouldn't describe the demonstrations or the strike as a right-left thing. I do accept that the government is a far-right government, but the population at this point is just against some of the measures, regardless of their political opinions, because some of the measures are just going against the people. Uh, even many of the people that voted for the government or who do not feel aligned to the left. And actually, that is one of the strategies that the government has used to delegitimize the pro protest, saying that it is the left, or that they are being used and guided by a left candidate, or even by the dissidences of the guerrillas, which is not the case. Mm. Uh, it sounds like chaos. It sounds it like left chaos. Right. It sounds like chaos, Nicholas. You don't know who is for what. Um, this, is, this is not a good thing. And um, it sounds like it, it also started out with, with one issue and, and gathered other issues. And before you know it, it's everything. Can you, can you, um, do you agree with that? And can you explain it? Yeah, I agree, I agree. Originally it was about a tax reform, which was very aggressive, which was rather unfair. 
uh, that wanted to tax things that should not be taxed because uh, people livelihoods depend on that. So food, uh, basic food, uh, public utilities, and so on. That, that is the first thing. Uh, and it, it, this was met with unjustified government spends expenses like uh, the purchase of military equipment, which is more fit for state to state conflict instead of law enforcement operations, which should be uh, what the government is facing right now, uh, because our biggest armed conflict ended with the peace agreement. Uh, so this became about this. And then when the government responded with violence, it became about everything else, starting with the police violence during the demonstrations, but going back to protests in the past, and then about everything else, because the government, where a lot of people uh, hasn't done anything right in a lot of aspects and keeps blaming the previous government, even after three years in office. So, so, so it's just a lot of disappointment and anger against many of the policies of the government. Oh, that sounds like chaos. So how <clears throat> this is happening in various cities. Uh, the article I pulled up uh, um, is uh, reporting that there's violence in Cali, C-A-L-I, but is it happening in Bogota also? Is it happening all over the country? Right. So. I must say that right now, the intensity of the situation uh, has decreased a bit. And then you have uh, still some focuses of violence, some places where you have violence. One of them is Kali. Kali has, has not decreased at all. Uh, and some parts in Bogota and some parts in the rest of the country. But at the beginning, it was everywhere, everywhere. Uh, and right now, I would say that Bogota in some places uh, is, is still uh, an important point, but the main point is Cali. Cali is a city in the, in the southwest of, of Colombia going to the Pacific, and it has a lot of social complexities that make it prone to this violence and, and, and that makes it prone to division as well. When you say social complexities and division, you mean um, you know, diverse population? You mean uh, the disparity in income? Uh, do you mean the racial strife? Uh, what do you mean by that? Yeah, basically those two things, income and racial, that are actually intertwined. Uh, Cali originally, since the beginning of, of Colombia, even in the colonies, was uh, a place where a lot of sugar plantations were there. You had a lot of slavery, and you also had landowners. Landowners were white, uh, coming directly from the Spanish. Uh, conquerors and colonizers, and uh, and you have black people who come from slaves, and then you have a mixture of people, and this division has gone uh, has gone on and on and on. Uh, and the other complexity is that Cali has also been strongly affected by drug dealing businesses. Uh, oh, in the sure. worst time of drug dealing in Colombia, you had two cartels: the Cartel of Medellin, which is the most renowned one. And you had the cartel from Cali, which was the second one. And Cali has been the center of violence because of its uh, its closeness to the Pacific, which is one of the of the favorite routes uh, to take out drugs of the country. So you have a, a mixture of race conflicts, class conflicts, drug dealing, violence from all groups because it also had a lot a strong presence of guerrilla, so, so it has been very complicated, and you have a deeply divided society uh, because of all that. Okay, so yeah, let's talk about uh, COVID and the pandemic. How has that affected this? Has it been a, an exacerbating factor? Is it, has it, has it um, launched additional violence somehow, directly or indirectly? Uh, I said that, that it added up to, to the to the increase in violence and to the dissatisfaction of people. As, as I was saying, in, in early before COVID, there was another strike in 2019. Uh, it was a very strong strike where we saw a lot of the things that we are seeing nowadays, uh, not as strong, not as long, but still you could see like a bit of foreshadowing in, in, those, in those demonstrations, in that strike. And then you had uh, Christmas 2019, uh, this helped uh, that the demonstrations didn't continue. People went to prisons to the end of the year and so on. And then in the beginning of 2020, COVID started and then you had a pandemic, but the issues were still there. Actually, the plan 
from, from the National Strike Committee was to continue the strike in January. But then COVID came, lockdowns came, uh, COVID hit everyone differently uh, because remote work is possible for some people, but it's not possible for other people who, who uh, work in, in factories or who work in services. And usually the people who have more challenges uh, doing remote work are people with low income. Uh, so that was a factor to the satisfaction. And the other factor was that there was no strong social support from the government to these people. So a lot of people lost their jobs. A lot of people uh, had to start uh, using their, their savings to survive or to go out even uh, breaking lockdowns and, and whatever because they needed to eat, right? Um, so so this, this uh, added to the dissatisfaction. Also, it was, it was the satisfaction that could not be expressed during more than a year because people were in lockdowns and also lockdowns help the government to be more authoritarian because people, if people cannot go to the streets, if the government is using emergency powers or whatever uh, related figure, uh, they, they do a lot of things that would have more control. The Congress was not sessioning in person, so there's another lack of control you have. So of course, COVID helped uh, to these. Uh, and I think that they, they thought that they were going to get away with their tax reform because of that, but it was too much for the people that, and they didn't care. They, they just went to the streets, even in, in, in the middle of, of, of a COVID peak, because we have an outbreak since early year and, and, they, and they just went out. So you're in an outbreak now? Sorry? You're in an outbreak now. We, we are in an outbreak, yeah. We, we are in an outbreak, uh, but the people, actually what many of, of the demonstrators said was either we are going to die from COVID or we're going to die from hunger. This is the situation, so we have to go to the streets, which is very strong, but it, but is the reality of a lot of people, sadly. Well, you know, uh, there was an article in the paper uh, this morning, I think, about how some people in the U.S. were, um, they'd been locked down for a year. And uh, now it would pe people were supposed to go back to work in certain jobs, and they didn't want to go back. And uh, what, you know, what that tells you is that on the way in, COVID disrupts societies, and on the way out, COVID disrupts societies. Whatever is wrong will be you know, uh, 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 emphasized and exacerbate other effects. So um, I, th I think there's a parallel to be drawn somehow between what has happened in Colombia and uh, what has happened maybe in different ways, but nevertheless, a process that has happened elsewhere. So how, how deep is the violence? I mean, are people being, what weapons are being used? Uh, are people being injured, killed, taken to the hospital? Uh, what, what level of violence do we have in Colombia? Well, during the demonstrations, and I, I must say it mostly by the government without acknowledging that there has been some violence and serious violence from the from the from some of the demonstrators, and I, I wouldn't speak about the demonstrations as uh, the demonstrators as a whole because that, that's where, where where there's a key difference that the government is using in their favor, not telling the people about that. But but the people respond individually. The government responds as a collective, and the violence is terrible. You have people killed, you have people tortured, you have sexual violence, you have injury, you have non-conventional weapons, or you have crowd control weapons used in an, an, an appropriate manner. Uh, so so it, it's terrible. It's terrible. The things that we are seeing uh, are, for example, uh, live rounds being fired or uh, gas canisters or tear gas canisters being fired, but not to the, to the sky, but rather in a direct way oh. or even used uh, gas canisters which, uh, that have already expired. So you cannot guarantee the quality and the and the security of, of their contain or, or of their of their of the material you're throwing to them, uh, they have even found uh, I don't know shrapnel of all sorts being used. Uh, just regular violence, but the beatings have been terrible. Uh, you have forced disappearances as well uh, of people who are not even in the demonstrations, who are just walking by, and, and the police just grabs them because they are around and takes them and no one knows where. Uh, you have violence against human rights defenders, against uh, government officials from, from the local level who are trying to, to, to de-escalate the situation. So, so the violence is really, really bad. 
right now uh, the numbers are very high. There has been reports from Human Rights Watch, from Amnesty International. Uh, the UN has called several times for intervention. The Inter-American Commission did a visit. Like it, it has been really, really bad in the forms of violence that are taking place right now. So where does the government stand on this? Uh, are they, uh, do they want to quell the violence? Um, what, what position do they take? Um, what are what are their options and which options are they are they choosing? Right. So that's been I don't know if it's strange because now that you know the government, you know that this is their modus operandi, but it has not been very coherent, right? So you have them speaking publicly about the their when wanting to dialogue, but also condemning only the vandals, no mention about uh, police brutality, human rights violations, accountability, and so on. And something very strange that happened is that during the day you had dialogues, you had peaceful demonstrations, uh, you had law enforcement mostly complying with the law, and then at night after nightfall, abuses took place in a big scale. And all the forced disappearances, the killings, the paramilitary groups taking uh, collaborating with the police, everything took place uh, here, and there has not been a strong condemnation with the government. The government has been evasive to accountability. They even denied at first the entrance of the Inter-American Commission, but not in a straightforward way, because that would put them close to Cuba and Venezuela, which is what they tried the most not to be in, in their speech. But they were like, we will let you in after this and this happens. We would let you in after some months. We would let you in under certain conditions, which is not how human, how human rights organs work. Also, that has been the situation. There has been some dialogues, but the dialogues have not been very fruitful. Uh, they still um, condemn the vandals and speak about the vandals all the time. Uh, and that just creates more and more violence. And they also buck up all the time the police uh, in, in this place. So, so it's, it's very complicated and, that, and that's where they stand right now. Oh, very, very troubling. So <clears throat> what I get out of this is that once you, you pull the plug on the rule of law, once you pull the plug on social order and uh, the social compact, if you will, where people sort of have an under, underlying agreement um, not to violate the space and and the and the rights of others. Once you pull the plug on that, it's chaos, and it goes in any direction it wants. It's hard to predict where it'll go. Um, do you agree with me? And can you predict where this is going to go? Yeah, I, I totally agree, Jay. And uh, if we go back to the past two shows that we did, you could see things like that coming because you see the police being endorsed. You saw. A uh, whole situation of, of, of fragmented and widespread human rights violations taking place. And like they were pushing the boundary every time a bit more further and further and further and further and further. And, further. and now, when, when, when the time bomb uh, blows, uh, which is the situation we're facing right now, uh, they feel encouraged, they feel strong. And now the institutions that do not work as efficiently as you, as, as, as you would consider. Um, as where is it going? I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I don't think we will, we, we're heading into a dictatorship or things like that. Even if that is the opinion of, of many people, I talk to my Venezuelan friends who, who, who live abroad nowadays and they just feel saddened about what's going on because they say, you never think this is going to happen to you. And when we saw this in our country, we thought that what happened afterwards didn't happen. So that, that is something we should be careful about. This is a pre-election year. Next year, we're going to have president and Congress elections. Uh, and I really hope that they're going to go all right. There's nothing that indicates that they want to stay in power or they're going to subvert the rule of law to that point, uh, but something needs to change. Uh, and, and, and with needs to change, I don't say that they should, like the how people in Colombia should choose a left government. I think they should just choose someone who respects the rule of law and who actually will comply with the constitution. If it is right, center right, even far right, you can have far right governments that respect the rule of law. But what we need to ensure is that. Uh, and I think that is what is coming. Uh, 
the elections, and I didn't think that the alternatives are very clear right now. There's a lot of division in the opposition, uh, and there's a lot of division in the right as well, uh, because everyone wants to, to chip in with the government, but doesn't want to be with the government because of this. It's not very popular. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that is the situation, and the, I don't know where, where it is going right now. Well, um, what about you? Where are you going? Um, it, it, it strikes me that if you walked out on the street, uh, you couldn't be nearly as uh, sure of your own security as you, you might have been earlier. Um, it strikes me that, um, you know, if you had the opportunity to leave because it got intolerable, you would have a plan and you would leave. Uh, are people leaving? Right. Uh, so that is a complexity that the Colombian situation has always had. That even if you have phases of the country where you have full outbreaks of conflict, they don't hit as hard, uh, those of us who fortunately are privileged. So I, I cannot say that while I was there, uh, uh, right now I'm in the States uh, traveling, but I, uh, just traveling, I'll go, I'm going back in a couple of weeks. Uh, but uh, I wouldn't say that my safety was as affected when, I, when, when the strike was taking place. I just didn't go to the streets because I know that if I was caught in the middle of a demonstration, it would be gassed or, or something like that. So I don't do it, but it's not that they're going to come into my house and take me, right? Uh, that is the thing. But the situation is very saddening. There's not a lot of future. Uh, I didn't know what will happen after next year, but of course it is, it is complicated. And for me as a human rights lawyer, it is also concerning how this is going to go uh, after four years. Uh, I'm not even close to the, to the level of threat and danger that social leaders are or who actual human rights defenders who are on the ground are risky, but, but, uh, but uh, I speak publicly about what we do, why I speak about uh, the, the human rights abuses. And uh, well, today uh, I am safe, but if they keep uh, in the government and if they stay there um, and they don't have a lot of pressure of international pressure, which actually really makes them compliant, uh, it, it can be dangerous. Uh, so maybe living just in terms of life quality would be an option, but if things keep getting worse, uh, maybe leaving as a necessity just to guarantee and to anticipate uh, to the situations might, might be an option as it happened to actually the, the people in Venezuela, those mm -hmm. who left when they could and, and are safe. Yeah. And, and then others couldn't leave or had to leave everything behind in order to, to guarantee your safety. So, so you don't know, but it, it is scary. Nicholas, how's the press doing? How's freedom of speech doing? Uh, are the press uh, free to discuss these things? I think the press is free. The press is free. Uh, you have abuses on the ground against some journalists, but but not as a as a systematic persecution against the press. Uh, just something of the moment, right? Uh, and you have a lot of alternative media covering the situation. Of course, they feel afraid. Of course, um, they have been subject to some violence, uh, but I wouldn't say that there is a. a and attack that concerning again freedom of press and that has been one of the good things actually that the whole documentation of, of, of the strike has been done by by alternative press and they have been a very they have done a very thorough job that they could hand in to the inter-american commission actually uh, mm. so, so that is good having having freedom of press and having the judiciary safe i think are two things that we can rescue from the situation and that will guarantee in the future that the situation keeps within certain boundaries, even if it's escalated as it is right now. Yeah, guardrails, so to speak. So here's a big question we should spend a little time on. You know, you, you're familiar with the way things uh, go in the United States uh, in general. And uh, of course, you get the media from the United States and you have some training in the United States. So what can the United States learn? I mean, we, we had an insurrection on January 6th. And we have uh, people that elected office who deny the fact of that insurrection or who lie about it. Um, we have uh, people who refuse to investigate that insurrection. I mean, we know from Project Expedite Justice that you have to know the true facts if you're gonna deal with human rights violations and atrocities and violations of the rule of law, you have to know. And you can't know without 
an investigation or a commission. <clears throat> anyway, so my you must have reactions as to what the United States can learn from how this is devolving, how it has devolved in Colombia. Yeah, I think that the main lesson is that when you're talking about the rule of law, there is no threat too small and that timely action is everything, right? Uh, when this president that we have nowadays began his, his uh, candidacy to the presidency, he had like 4%, right? And no one knew who he was. Uh, we have discussed this. He, he held some positions at the international level, and then he was elected to the Congress, not by his own votes, but in a closed list system where the head of the list just gained a lot of votes that he, that he then uh, shared with the rest of the list and, and got him some representatives. So this is how he got to Congress. Uh, and no one thought he was going to be elected because he went so low, but then his mentor, uh, had a lot of importance. It is a former president who was liked by a lot of people. Uh, they have the media on their side. They have corporate groups on their side. Uh, and they are very good at propaganda, uh, including fake news and, and so on, and conspiracy theories and so on. Uh, and when we noticed that this was a problem, because I would say that any policy against rule of law is a problem, uh, I think it was too late. It was too late. There was not enough uh, time to counter the effects of fake news. There was no enough time to build a strong uh, coalition and candidacy against uh, this type of, of, of projects. And now, three years later, we are seeing the consequences. Uh, so we think there is no threat too small. You should take them seriously. Uh, you should investigate. And you should bring accountability accountability because accountability also brings a series of consequences that not only impact the individuals uh, that participated in, in the crimes but also affect the movements but it is not the same to have a leader who is investigated to have a leader that is convicted and can no longer participate in politics for example uh, so we think that is that is very important and to have strong strong speeches and strong rule of law um, information going around to the people because if the people receive fake information and they don't have true information to compare it with they're just going to stay with fake information that makes them feel safe or scared with a promise of safety so, so that is very important i would say that and the other thing is um <clears throat> you know we've had we've had uh, street scenes um we had street scenes um last year there were, and you could say it's it stemmed out of uh, Black Lives Matter, but it was went beyond that in a number of American cities. Um, and it, does, it runs a kind of a parallel where you start a protest on one issue, and before you know it, people take that as license um, to protest against everything. And the police take the protest as license um, to use violence and force, uh, including illegal force uh, on the protesters. And before you know it, you, you have a melee in the streets. Um, and I gather that, you know, to some extent, that's what you've been talking about here in Colombia. So <clears throat> it seems to me that we've already had a smattering of that in the United States. And we have um, the elements of what you've been talking about, uh, not all exactly the same, but nevertheless, elements as parallels that we can draw uh, from a social psychological point of view. So my question is, uh, you know, you, you do know both societies, and I wonder what your, your thought is about whether what has happened in Colombia can happen in the United States. Well, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know, but I, I think there are a lot of things one, one can learn from each other. The first one is uh, that the society as a whole Anything that is one belief that both societies need to overcome, uh, need to understand that peaceful demonstration, assemblies, and even protests, even if they are disruptive, because a protest needs to be disruptive to be effective, are okay and are part of democracy. If we win that battle as a society and start as a society surrounding the protesters and the demonstrations, because many of us will not go to the streets because a series of reasons. I think we've won. That, that's the first thing. Uh, if you protect the demonstrators and the society condemns violence against the demonstration, that is the first thing. 
Uh, the second thing I need, I consider we, we need to learn is what comes after the demonstrations. Uh, because you're yelling for the government to listen to you. And if you're disruptive or effective enough, they will listen to you. But when these things get, get out of hand is when you come to the table and then you don't know what you're gonna say because you know you're not in favor of what's going on, but there needs to be concrete organization and coordination beforehand or maybe during the demonstrations to bring strong points to the table. I think that's, that's the second thing that is very important. Uh, and the third one is that you need to teach your law enforcement about human rights and their limits. And I know it flows because I, I know people from the military and as most of the people in the military in my country and in the States are good people, people who actually want to serve their country. I, I, I don't doubt that. But what they're being said is not right and they're being put in danger. And then when accountability procedures come, the ones who end up in jail or convicted are the men and women who serve. But the institution taught them and told them that some things that should not be done could be done. So, so that is key. Uh, a strong training, human rights, proportionality, use of force, and so on to, to, to the law enforcement is a protection to the community, to the rule of law, and also to law enforcement. Uh, because these people think they do what they can do, but, but they don't. And then there's a problem from, for them, and the politicians are not going to stand behind them when they're convicted. Actually, an easy way to, to get out of accountability as a politician is just ordering investigations on the individuals instead of addressing the whole problem with the force. That is not a problem of individuals. Oh, yeah, that, we have that problem. I mean, we have, we have systemic issues that have been proving a long time. And, um, you, you know, you can talk about individuals, but you really have to think bigger than that. You have to think about fixing it, fixing the system. Uh, what, one of the things that I get out of our discussion and your remarks, Nicholas, is, is this, that if you have an angry protest out there, which, which has the possibility of expanding the issues and expanding their, their fervor, so to speak, and their street presence, um, one way to deal with this is to simply say and mean that you are going um, to listen, that you respect their views and you take them seriously and you're going to do something about it. Uh, rather than just beat them up on the street. Has this, has this been tried? Um, has it been tried well or badly? Uh, do you think it would work if tried correctly? I think it would. Although I, I, I believe that also social anger needs to be expressed in some way. It's not like, okay, heard you, get out of the streets, let's sit on a table. That, that's not the way of doing it. People have the right and societies need the need, need to express their emotions. And anger is a valid emotion. Uh, and if it doesn't reach to the level of violence, it's valid and it's necessary. The government and the people need to know and need to be allowed to express their anger. Uh, but then comes, this, as you say, a moment of sitting down and listening. Uh, I think that was done partially uh, at the local level at, at Colombia. And to some extent, it worked. And uh, some agreements have, have come from that, but it needs a lot of political will and it needs a lot of follow-up, both from, from the government and from the demonstrators, uh, because otherwise you're just gonna add another element to, to, the, to the insatisfaction that is the, the lack of compliance with previous agreements. So, so that is key. But absolutely, dialogue is, is the way. Like a, a demonstration is never a, a solution of itself. It's just, I mean, to one, express anger, that social emotions are very important and, and that are healthy for our society, and two, to, to make the government listen. But once they listen, you need to do something about it. You know, it strikes me also that at the end of the day, in order to maintain the social compact, because without the social compact, we are, we are in Lord of the Flies. Without the social compact, we're in, we're in continuing chaos, devolving chaos. Um, you have to give people some confidence. You have to create public, real public confidence, not, not fake public confidence, not um, you know, propaganda public confidence. So I, I guess um, if, you're, if you are the government, your burden in a situation like that is to find ways to make people confident, not only of the existing administration, but the system. Is this, do you think this is doable? Is it doable in in Colombia, is it doable in other places? I think it's doable. 
the thing is if they want to do it and they're willing to do what is necessary because you need to be transparent you need to integrate a government with people from the other side uh and and these governments who tend to be very authoritarian they're very closed on themselves they name their friends they name people that think like them and that is no way to have a healthy government and a healthy public administration. Actually, you need people from all sides and you need experts from all sides to tell you what's necessary. And even to have people from, your, from the other side sitting beside you, telling you you are not right, we think differently, and there you find a consensus. So I think that transparency and inclusion is the solution, of course, uh, but uh, that is not a point if, of, of if it's possible or not, but if they're willing to do it or not, because that requires a lot of, I don't know, moral fiber in the first sense, and uh, a, a lot of skills in leadership as well, because you have your, your government plan and you need to, to, to make it happen, but you need to govern for all of the population. Yeah, you have to go back to the fundamentals and remember the government is there to serve the people and the people are there to and be part of the government. It's all, it's a two-way street. Well, thank you so much, Nicholas. It's, it's always fabulous to talk to you. I so enjoy your comments and your thought. Uh, and I hope we can do this again soon. And I wish you well in all particulars. Thank you, Jay. Thank you for the invitation. And we'll keep you updated about what's going on at home. Please, thanks. Aloha.